These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Up north, in the Kingdom of Israel, wicked King Ahab has died in battle, to be replaced by the equally wicked Ahaziah. And down in the south, good King Jehoshaphat has been ruling for some time now, but we're going to stay in the north for now. Our biblical narrative for Ahaziah really focuses on his Baal worship, which appears to have been largely exclusive of Yahweh. Now, it is very typical in polytheist societies for an individual to select a particular god or a few gods as primary focus of worship, with the rest not being ignored, but definitely not being given the same attention. Well, all this ball focus in a king of Israel attracts the attention of Elijah, who drops some fire on some of Ahaziah's soldiers, but eventually comes over and explains that all of Ahaziah's problems are arising because he isn't worshipping the right god. Ahaziah, as a worshipper of a different god, isn't a big fan of this, but Elijah doesn't care about Ahaziah's opinion, and he curses the king to die, then he dies. Also, by the way, the Moabites broke free during his reign, and uh, you can learn the rest of the story by reading the history of the kings of Israel, which has been lost. Or, in this one particular case, we can learn the rest of the story by asking King Mesha of Moab. You see, at the same time as Jehoshaphat in Judah and Ahaziah in Israel, the kingdom of Moab was ruled by Mesha, who won a great victory, led his people into great glory, and most importantly, wrote about it on a stone called the Mesha Stela, which survives to this day. It is pretty readable, I mean, if you can read the Canaanite alphabet, not only is the stone still in decent shape, the Moabite language is quite similar to Hebrew. Of course, no one ever says that Hebrew is quite similar to Moabite, because we all just assume there's an implicit priority to the languages, but of course they are cousin languages, both derived from the earlier Western Semitic dialects common to Canaan. Now, we know almost nothing about the origins of the Moabites. In fact, from a purely secular standpoint, we know about as much of the Moabite origins as we do of Israelite origins. We do get a biblical story that they originate from Abraham's cousin, but what we would really like is a Moabite source making even an oblique mention of anything like this to confirm that they shared the same general outline of their origins. And without that, we really might have to ignore the story of Lot completely, as it could well have been basically hostile propaganda against an enemy neighbor. Lot doesn't acquit himself very well in the Genesis account. Without even that, we haven't the slightest idea where they came from. Now, some claim that they are indigenous and simply coalesced from the people who happen to be living there. But of course, no one's actually indigenous to anywhere except East Africa, where humanity first arose. Some claim they may have been from deeper in the Arabian Peninsula, though I've yet to see a source or a reasoning for that speculation beyond, it seems likely? At the very least, the biblical writers seem to think that the Moabites were present in the region prior to the Israelite entry. And it seems entirely plausible that the people in that particular land simply settled and urbanized at about the same time the rest of Canaan did, though with a much lesser degree of settling and urbanization because their land is pretty marginal, even by the often marginal standards of the Levant in general. It isn't clear that there was such a thing as a specifically Moabite place or kingdom, rather just some towns and tribes, and the first possible mention we get is from Ramesses the Great, sometime around 1250-ish, who mentions in passing that he conquered the region of Moab alongside a whole bunch of other places. Now, this could be an ethnic or geographic designation, 
or it could be a sign that the region had, presumably fairly recently, been unified by some long-forgotten minor conqueror. The biblical description we have is of a place which is generally unified under a king. And while the borders are super fuzzy, the general idea of a territory of Moab on the inland side of the Dead Sea, so like if you start in Jerusalem, then get to the Dead Sea, then cross the Dead Sea, boom, you're in modern-day Jordan, you're in ancient Moab. And that stays pretty consistent through to the ultimate conquest of the region by the great empires, at which point Moab seems to like slowly vanish, eventually replaced by the Nabataeans and various sorts of Arabs. Some small Jordanian towns do claim to be Moabite descendants, but since we don't have any continuous history for those places, skeptics generally assume that these folks are just reading biblical history and identifying themselves with what they read, rather like the modern case of the Slavic people in North Macedonia claiming to be ancestral Macedonians. Now anyway, that's an overview of not quite a thousand years of Moabite history, and if you're interested enough to get deeper into the archaeology, you're going to mostly find that they're relatively just poorer and less settled analogs of their neighbors. In a way, their very obscurity is a fun case study in what Israel would look like without the Bible or any written documentation. We have a few scattered mentions from various conquerors and neighbors, some personal names, some basic records in the much later periods, and just enough writing to know that their language was pretty close to that of their neighbors. But mixed into all that easily summarizable history is a single significant written record called the Mesha Stella, and was discovered in the ruins of the Moabite capital of Debon, written by King Mesha of Moab sometime around 850 BCE, or more likely a little bit later, sort of later in his life. The stella opens in a pretty standard way. We don't have much illustrations or many surroundings to give it context, but thankfully Mesha is a fairly descriptive guy for the most part. He begins with, I am Mesha, the son of Chemoshiati, the king of Moab from Dibon. My father was king over Moab for thirty years and I was king after my father." Now we're going to find out that his father, Chemoshiati, was likely a vassal king for some or all of this period, but we're kind of fuzzy on the chronology here. That 30 years being a nice round number, it is plausible, but it's also suspicious. Anyway, it continues, "...and in Karko I made this high place for Chemosh." because he has delivered me from all kings, and because he has made me look down on all my enemies." Now, Chemosh is a big deal in Moabite studies for a number of reasons. First of all, the name itself is debated. Moabite, like Hebrew and other Semitic languages, didn't write its vowels. And some have reason, based on linguistic evidence from way after the Moabites had vanished and a little bit from real early in history, to think that the god's name was Kamosh, potentially the same that we see worshipped very early on in 3rd millennium Syria, and who gave his name to Kar Kamosh, or the city I usually call Karchemish but that the biblical writers changed it in the Bible, where we do sometimes have vowel markings of various levels of reliability to chemosh, to make it rhyme with biosh, a word meaning stench. Now, as we've seen, this would hardly be the first time that the biblical writers adjusted someone's name to make it into a slur, and so it is kind of a plausible theory on that account. On the other hand, unless I've missed an important evidence somewhere, the reasons that anyone thinks that it is Kamosh rather than Chemosh are based on extremely late or early data points like the vowels in the Septuagint or super ancient Eblaite tablets, and the language could have shifted over many similarities, 
and any similarity with a mean Hebrew word could be a coincidence. Now, I'm going to resolve this here on the show mostly by just sort of mumbling the name and hoping no one notices which gets used. But the real importance of Kumush is that he is the national god of Moab. He is the only deity that we hear significant amounts of anything about, both in the Bible and in our very few Moabite sources. Now, what that actually means is anyone's guess. If you assume, as many do, that pretty much everyone in the ancient world was, by default, polytheist, then you just write a note in your textbook to the effect that, oh, they doubtless worshipped other gods as well. Now, that's all well and good, but it's ultimately an assumption. We have Moabite personal names, which invoke Baal and El, as well as Kamish, but as we saw in King David's time, these two could be the names of pagan gods, or they could be titles for the national god, meaning respectively Lord and God, both of which, of course, are titles we use in English, in a perfectly orthodox Christian context for our God. The biblical writers seem to believe that Israel, Moab, Ammon, and Edom all had a single national God. See, particularly Deuteronomy chapter 32, but the idea of different places being under different heavenly authorities can be read into a good amount of the Old Testament. The point is that if the biblical authors are correct, then this entire region, Moab and Israel included, are not intending to be polytheistic places, but perhaps henotheistic, holding to a singular god while potentially acknowledging the mere existence of others. Now, this would be, as they say nowadays, big if true, but with so little to work on, on the topic of Moab especially, we have nowhere to go with it until further evidence shows up. Interesting to think about, though. Speaking of interesting, uh, King Mesha explains some history. Omri was the king of Israel, and he oppressed Moab for many days, for Chemosh was angry with his land and his son succeeded him. And he said, he too, I will oppress Moab. In my days he did so, but I looked down on him and on his house, and Israel has gone to ruin. Yes, it has gone to ruin forever. Ha 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 Omri had taken possession of the whole land of Medaba, and he lived there in his days and half the days of his son, 40 years but Chemosh restored it in my days. The explanation for a hard time in Moab is the same as an explanation for hard times in Israel. The national god is angry with his land. We don't hear the theological reason for Chemosh's anger, which is a real shame, but I guess understandable in an official document like this. Omri conquering Moab is consistent with what little we know of his reign, and the idea of Ahab the wicked deciding to oppress Moab simply out of evil rather than for, you know, political gain or wealth is also amusingly consistent with the biblical account, because the biblical writers didn't like Ahab any more than the Moabite author did. That last bit is basically exactly what we have in the first line of 2 Kings, that Moab gained independence at the death of Ahab, though the biblical account oddly fails to mention the god Chemosh being involved in Moabite independence. Funny that. Mesha does continue. And I built Baal Meon, and I made in it a water reservoir, and I built Kiriathaim, and the men of Gad lived in the land of Ataroth from ancient times. And the king of Israel built Ataroth for himself. And I fought against the city, and I captured. And I killed all the people from the city as a sacrifice for Chemosh and for Moab. And I brought back the fire hearth of his uncle from there. And I hauled it before the face of Chemosh in Kerioth, 
and I made the men of Sharon live there, as well as the men of Maharith. And Chemosh said to me, Go, take Nebo from Israel. And I went in the night, and I fought against it from the break of dawn until noon, and I took it, and I killed its whole population, 7,000 male citizens and aliens, female citizens and aliens, and servant girls. For I had put it to the ban of Ashtar Chemosh. And from there I took the vessels of Yahweh, and I hauled them before the face of Chemosh. And the king of Israel had built Jahaz, and he stayed there during his campaigns against me, and Chemosh drove him away before my face. I took two hundred men from Moab, all its division, and I led it up to Jahaz, and I have taken it in order to add it to Debon. Now this is a pretty interesting section. After learning that Mesha engaged in the kind of construction projects expected of an ancient king, we hear all about his wars. Interestingly, there is a suggestion here that the people of Gad, who we usually think of as a tribe of Israel, may have been viewed by Mesha as a separate and perhaps more ancient people than Israel though there are also pretty solid harmonizations here, and also Mesha could well just be mistaken on that point. Gad, of course, is the tribe on the east side of the Jordan, and more interesting is that Reuben is usually mentioned as the tribe just south of Gad, except that here it seems Moab is just south of Gad instead. Now, has Reuben been conquered? perhaps as part of the Moabite independence revolt, or is it being counted as part of Gad by a king uninterested in minor tribal distinctions? We have no clear picture of Reuben either biblically or in this stella during this era, so we simply have no idea what's going on with them. The meat of all this, though, is that Mesha is claiming to have enacted a pretty massive slaughter. Now, this slaughter is debated because, of course, everything is debated. Is this Moab reveling in blood as a signaling mechanism, the way that the Assyrians are starting to do, where they commit and publish atrocities in order to frighten their potential opponents into surrender? Or is this basically a harem-style mass sacrifice to the national god, much the way that these slaughters from the Book of Judges were all being committed in honor of the Israelite national god. The latter seems to be the more popular view, especially with how Chemosh is being mentioned here, which has lent credence to the idea that Chemosh is a god of human sacrifice, a view we already get from the biblical accounts. But then, at the same time, these sorts of mass slaughters in Joshua's campaign aren't used to call Yahweh a god of human sacrifice, so we do need a bit of a pause here to make sure we're being consistent. We know that Canaanite faith, in general, had some cults which involved some infant sacrifice rituals. But for one, it isn't clear that Moabite worship is necessarily connected to those Canaanite cults. We have to assume Chemosh is part of a wider pantheon and not an individual national god to assume that. And for another, it isn't clear that the practice of sacrificing your own children, which in a theological sense is like giving your absolute best to God in times of extreme need, it isn't clear that that generalizes to the slaughter of enemies as a religious act rather than merely a political one. My own guess, based on one Moabite tablet and, like, one biblical line, which is all any of us have to guess over, is that Chemosh worship involved both harem slaughters in the name of the god and infant sacrifice, but that the two were theologically distinct matters. Anyway, one extra fun bonus bit in there is about the vessels of Yahweh. Some have thought these might be cult icons of Yahweh, but more likely 
They're like bowls or cups that have been devoted to the god, probably holding basically the equivalent of sacrament wine or holding bits of sacrifices for the god. More interesting than imagining that the northern kingdom is engaging in idolatry and acting like this is a scandalous revelation, even though this is something that the Bible constantly complains about, is the fact that these sacred vassals seem to have been way over in Gad. So not only does northern Israel have major worship centers in Bethel and Dan, but also across the Jordan, which remember that Yahweh shrines outside the Promised Land almost started a war back in Joshua's time, but now I think we can reasonably conclude that at least some level of systematized Yahweh ritual practice was going on all throughout the Northern Territory. And we can trust Mesha here because he probably doesn't have a dog in a theological fight which most of it wouldn't even exist for mil until millennia after he was dead. Anyway, after discussing that campaign against Gad, none of which is explicitly mentioned in the Bible because official chronicles hate mentioning defeats, Mesha discusses his building projects. I have built Karko, the walls of the woods and the wall of the citadel, and I have built its gates, and I have built its towers, and I have built the house of the king, and I have made the double reservoir for the spring in the innermost of the city. Now, there was no cistern in the innermost of the city, in Karko, and I said to all the people, Make each one of you a cistern in his house. And I cut out the moat for Karko by means of prisoners from Israel. Now that last bit isn't his own construction project, but mandatory cisterns is really interesting. We usually characterize ancient governments as extremely minimal because they lacked the capacity or interest to undertake the sort of dense regulations that modern states routinely mandate. But here's an example that they were certainly capable of attempting to impose the technocratic solutions on a populace. They could imagine the government doing all kinds of things, they just usually lacked the capacity for it. Now, it isn't clear at all how successful this command was, but it is interesting that it was attempted. And, by the way, as someone who lives in a dry area, the fact that more of my neighbors don't have cisterns and rely wholly on water deliveries, wells, or city water absolutely baffles me. Wells run dry, as well Mesha was aware. I personally, at my house, use both a well and a rainwater harvest to fill a couple cisterns, which I'm expanding as often as I can afford it. Public service announcement here, even modern water systems can fail, even without a world-ending disaster. And if you're anywhere drier than a swamp or a rainforest and you're listening to me, you should have some sort of personal water collection in your home if you have the means for it. Listen to King Mesha if you're not going to listen to me. Make each one of you a cistern in your house. This public service message brought to you by, I don't know, me. Anyway, I have built a roarer, and I made the military road in the Arnon. I have built Beth Bamoth for it had been destroyed. I have built Bezer, for it lay in ruins, and the men of Dibon stood in battle order, for all Dibon they were in subjection. And I am the king over hundreds in the towns which I have added to the land. And I have built the house of Mediba, and the house of Diblathaim, and the house of Baal Meon, and I have brought there the flocks of the land. Then, after accounting of this great prosperity of Moab, which, even at this great wondrous peak, was probably still mostly a miserable desert, he starts a campaign against Judah. And Horonayim, the house of David, lived in it. And Chemosh said to me, Go down, fight against Horonayim. 
and I went down, and Chemosh restored it in my days. And from there I did something, and something else happened, and the rest is cut off, right at a really interesting part. You see, we don't know where Horonayim is exactly, but it seems to be in the south, near the Dead Sea, either south of the sea or on the south part of the eastern coast of the sea, geographically Moabite territory, currently held by the House of David. Now, this is a huge cliffhanger because it seems to be leading us into a war centered around the southern part of the Dead Sea. And biblically, the big story is that Israel, Judah, and Edom all circle around the south end of the Dead Sea for their famous campaign against Moab. Now, as a side note, Chronicles does mention that at some point Moab attacked Judah in a loose coalition with the Ammonites and an obscure minor people called the Mayanites, which ended in the destruction and dedication of the Mayanites to Yahweh, just as the Moabites had been sacredly slaughtering the Israelites in Mesha's Stella, but it isn't clear if this is a completely different war or somehow tied into one of the others that we hear about. And by the way, before we go on, we've now read about 95% of the entire written corpus of the Moabite language, making you now familiar with basically the entire surviving cultural output of an entire ancient nation. There are a small handful of other inscriptions, but these are of minimal cultural importance. There's a three-line building dedication. There's a couple of personal seals that's basically just... This is my name. This thing belongs to me. So you can tell people now that you're an expert in Moabite literary culture and be super cool at all the parties. At least I, I think that's the case. No one's invited me to any parties after I started bragging about my Moabite literary credentials, which I'm sure is just a coincidence. Anyway, because I'm great at segues and never fall into weird tangents, we jump right back over to the biblical narrative. Ahab died, and the Moabites broke free, and then his son Ahaziah died and was replaced by Ahab's other son, Joram, or Jehoram, which means Yahweh is exalted. And true to his name, he does get some Bible bonus points by ending the royal worship of Baal, though continuing to permit Yahwistic idolatry and general polytheism in the nation. Meanwhile, Jehoshaphat is still king down in Judah because that guy lasts a pretty long time. Now, in this account, which may or may not be actually related to anything in the Meshestella, this could be a whole completely separate war, Jehoram of Israel pops on down to Jehoshaphat in Judah. Reading between the lines here, King Mesha of Moab might have a pretty solid army put together, because the king of Israel emphatically does not want to attack Moab in the north, even though this would be passing through presumably the friendly territories of Gad and Reuben, suggesting that this path might be well fortified, might be otherwise unavailable to them, Instead, he reaches out to Jehoshaphat for an alliance and permission to march his army south, around the southern end of the Dead Sea, to, to hit the presumably undefended Moabite rear. Jehoshaphat agrees and musters the army of Judah to join in the battle. And suddenly, with no explanation, the king of Edom also appears and is part of the alliance. Now, it could be, maybe, maybe, that the Edomite king was approached in exactly the same way Jehoshaphat was, but the text doesn't mention it because the text doesn't care. More likely, though, it seems that just as Moab was in subjugation to Israel, not annexed, but like vassalized for a few generations, Edom as well, even more poor and marginal than Moab, is a vassal of Judah and naturally accompanies Judah's army when called out. This also seems likely because the last fragment of the Mesha Stella seems to think that Judah is the primary Moabite enemy to the south, 
leaving Edom unmentioned despite actually being, in purely geographic terms, the region that's to the south. Now, the Book of Kings makes it clear that this episode is mentioned pretty much only because it involves the prophet Elisha, and all that drama isn't too important for our purposes. There is a bit of fun Christian wordplay here, though. Elisha is mentioned, again here, as being the son of Shaphat, which is our word judge, and brief note inside of our note. In our Judges episode, I was reading it as Shofet, and I'm still uncertain as to why it's Shofet sometimes and Shafat other times. They do seem to have basically the same meaning. I don't know. Anyway, Elisha is the son of a judge, or perhaps a guy named Judge, and he's meeting Jeho Shafat whose name means Jeho, or Yahweh, is the judge. Putting them together would, if we see Elisha as a type of Christ, make Elisha into the metaphorical son of Yahweh in his aspect as judge. It's a whole rabbit hole. There's really no verse in scripture about which you couldn't write a whole essay, or a sermon, or often an entire book. None of that matters. The point for us is that this combined army has wandered down south to pass through the harder desert, around the south end of the Dead Sea, in order to attack Moab and bring it back into Israelite vassalage. However, they start off poorly, getting lost in the desert for seven days. This, of course, is attributed to God and to the prophets but really points to the fact that the days of the Habiru armies of Saul and David, not to mention Joshua and the judges, are now long gone. These are farmer warriors, raised for a campaign like the settled kingdoms around them, and the idea of Hebrew as Habiru is by now well out of the text, and out of the reality of the two kingdoms as well. The Edomites also being lost is a bit odd here, but perhaps they were bringing a settled army as well, or perhaps being the junior partners, no one was listening to them, because that had just Edomites. What, what do they know? Whatever the case, the army was saved through the providence of God, and they do find some water and are able to establish camp. The Moabite army makes its way down south to respond, and then the combined Israel-Judah-Edomite army fakes a huge falling out, only to ambush the overconfident Moabites. They then rampage through Moab, plundering all they can and destroying what they can't, as is suitable for the punishment of a rebel nation. And after all this, the historian records almost as an afterthought some of the most understated lines in all of Scripture. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was going against him, he took with him seven hundred swordsmen to break through, opposite to the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And then there came great wrath against Israel, and they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. Now, theologically, this passage could get its whole podcast. What divine power was the source of the wrath? If it is Chemosh, how does Chemosh have power in the Bible against God's people? If it's God's wrath, why is he apparently responding to a child's sacrifice? Crucially, though, in a secular sense, we don't know if this war ended diplomatically, with the death of Mesha's heir being a sign of him allowing the Israelites to select his successor and then a return of Moab to vassalage, or if it ended somehow militarily with a great Moabite victory being the thing which pushed the, army, the allied armies back to their own lands. Part of the problem here is that we hear nothing at all about Mesha or Moab or anything touching it until generations later, 
not archaeologically, not in the Mesha Stella, not in the Bible, so we don't know how the situation looked after it was resolved. Part of the issue is that the Mesha Stella is broken off at the end, and also that the Book of Kings is way more interested in Elisha and the Shunammite woman than high power politics. But one thing we can say is that even as we end today's episode with a disappointing lack of information, going forward things do start to get a bit clearer geopolitically. We're going to keep our focus mostly on Israel for now, saving the meat of the wider world for when we get to Assyria. But the wider world is going to start poking its head in from time to time. And partly because of that, the whole region of Canaan and Israel is starting to get a bit wealthier, starting to produce more objects and build more cities. And so they're all starting to show up a bit more in archaeological surveys. We are well into historical Israel now, and we're also getting into prosperous Israel, a bit of a change from the desert-dwelling social outcasts that they started as. At the same time, their neighbors, soon to get a name change from Canaanite to Phoenician, have also started to build up wealth in a big way. So we'll, we're going to take a frustratingly brief detour to look at the coast and out over the waters while continuing our biblical narrative. So join us next time for the reign of Jehoshaphat and a brief history of Byblos, Sidon, and Tyre and a bit of material prosperity mixed in with uh, spiritual poverty. Thank you for listening.